Hello and welcome to the Monster Mechanics Podcast, where we take creatures of myth and media and see how they can be improved. I am your host, Scott Paladin, and with me as always is the Mario to my Luigi, Zach Jaquez. Hey, how's it going? And with us as never before, the Kenny Omega to our Mario and Luigi, Jeff Stormer. You came expecting to record a podcast with a man, but instead you have recorded with a god? <laughs> well, and today we are talking about Santa Claus. That's a Kenny Omega reference. I'm excited. It's, all, it's, it's actually an M. Bison reference from Street Fighter 94, but uh, it is also a Kenny Omega reference. I'm here for it. So uh, considering the demographics of our podcast, I don't expect anybody's going to be completely unfamiliar with Santa Claus, but I'm going to give some context anyway. There actually is a historical uh, uh, St. Nicholas, uh, sort of one of the central figures. He was a bishop in Turkey of uh, from a city called Myra and then was canonized after his death. And there's a whole big thing about his bones being taken out of his original their original resting place to another temple. And then also fragments of it were taken to Italy and he's gotten all over the place. And he became associated with a celebration of giving gifts to children. And that legend then moved up into Central Europe, where it sort of went into the giant tumble dryer of folk uh, legends and uh, got mixed up with things like uh, Wotan or Odin from uh, Norse mythology and and later figures like Sinterklaas and um, Father Christmas and ended up getting sort of smashed together into this character that has ended up in American folklore as Santa Claus. And that was really nailed down actually quite recently, it seems like the idea of Santa Claus being this, you know, fat guy in a red coat and not being like a tiny elf or like a really gaunt old bishop. <laughs> All of those are sort of the traditional versions of it. And uh, sometimes he's he's followed around by um, other figures like Krampus or Schwarzpeter, things like that. But for the that those those legends haven't seemed to come over to America here. And so we've got this like guy in a red suit now who's kind of fat and lives at the North Pole and has reindeer, which, you know, are always depicted as much larger than they actually are in real life for some reason. So now uh, 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 real quick, fun fact, um, I'm sure you might probably know this, but do you know why the idea of like the modern picture of Santa Claus as the fat guy in the in the red and white suit came to be? Because it's uh, depressing in a, in a capitalistic sort of way, but it is nonetheless uh, fascinating from like a cultural anthropology kind yeah, of way. The uh, folk wisdom that I hear is this from the uh, Coca Cola advertisements. So, yeah, it is correct. It is a Coca. It's the Coca Cola ads or like the the famous depiction of him in the red and white suit because yep. it is the Coke colors. <laughs> Which yeah, again, how much of our culture has been That's uh, de <laughs> depressing? Yeah, <laughs> it's a depressing fact. Yeah, if we want to, if you want to get really depressed, go through and find all the things that like this was originally an advertisement, and like, oh yeah, you will, you will die. American culture is is a vapid wasteland of capitalism. This is, this is all true. These are all true facts. But we're here to celebrate that vapid wasteland today. <laughs> so I have all kinds of questions, and but when we were sort of talking about this concept before um, on chat before this episode, uh, Jeff, you came storming out of the gate. You say you have a grand unified Santa theory. I do. I do. Uh, a gust. I have. I have the gust. I call it. And the gust uh, is a, a a a central theory that explains a lot of Santa Clausian lore. Okay. And really gives some specific like uh, it takes a lot of factors and it comes to one central conclusion, which I think is very compelling. Well, I'm excited to learn about this Santa Claus mythos you you've established. So let me break down some fundamental truths about Santa Claus. Yes. He was once a real person who died mm -hmm. and was made into this this figure. Mm -hmm. The other sort of canonical cultural truths about Santa Claus are he appears on Christmas like and he specifically appears for children who are good, right? Mm -hmm. Or bad, he gives you a lump of coal. But like the idea that he appears for children on Christmas, there is the very Polar Express idea that like if you stop believing, he will stop showing up. Mm -hmm. The idea that like grown ups stop seeing him because they stop believing. So he is sort of powered by your belief mm -hmm. there's also the idea that like he has all of these magical abilities and they sort of are inherently tied around this one specific goal of appearing appearing for children and sort of breaking the laws of reality in order to be where he needs to be around around these children and to you know give them gifts and they as they need it Mm -hmm. There is also the slightly odder idea that he is also a demon hunter. Like that is another canon thing that like he travels the country like killing demons. Like that is a thing about Santa Claus. Now, all of these things 
here is my theory. Here is my big pitch for the both of you. Okay. I hope that you're ready for this. Hit me. My body is ready. In thinking about all of these truths, I realized there is another beloved figure in pop culture who is powered by your belief in him, who is uh, appears only in the in the minds of children. There is another saying piece of Santa Claus lore that I think makes this a little clearer, and that is that the common wisdom is that if you are awake, Santa Claus isn't going to come. There is another canonical figure that appears in the dreams of sleeping children. I think I see where this is going. That is powered by your belief in him. <laughs> That also comes from a realm of demons. I would posit that Santa Claus is a is a dream construct figure in the same realm as one Freddy Krueger. <laughs> this is my this is my this is my monster mechanics <laughs> grand unified Santa Claus theory is that Santa Claus is a dream construct that yes. is constructed by a world of children that believe in Santa Claus mm -hmm. is given the power to do good yes. because children believe in him unquestioningly. Yes. And because children also believe in monsters. Yes. Is given the power to slay monsters is very much the heroic counterpart to one Freddy Krueger, who is also a dream figure that, that appears in the minds of children. I love this. No, I'm just, I'm loving the idea. All of this is to say, when are we going to get Santa Claus versus Freddy? <laughs> that feels like the real power, power battle. Well, I'll just say, I'm loving the idea of Santa showing up on Christmas Eve, dropping off presents, and then checking on your bed for monsters. That is good. That's a great, that's, that's a good pitch right there. Yeah. Okay. So my immediate question, I love this theory, but my immediate question is, okay, are Santa Claus and Freddy Krueger, like the two central pillars of this cosmos, like they are the the avatars of both the good and bad of the dream realm, or are they just two figures of a larger world where there are multiple like is is Santa the only good guy and Freddy the only bad guy, or are they just each representative of a larger population of these kinds of creatures? It's got to be a larger population because okay. that's how you factor in creatures like the Krampus or. Mm -hmm. You know, I think you could probably even extend this to there's like there's there's all sorts of like dream terrors and things yeah. that like appear that all kind of tie into this theory of like they appear in your dreams and because you you believe in them, they give them power. And that Santa Claus just happens to be like the most powerful right. is because much like Freddy Krueger. And this is an interesting thing to consider. The fact that they were once in their respective canons, real people that die and therefore have that extra level of, you know, believability. Like the Krampus is not a re – was never – there's never – he would be like, well, historical reports actually report a man named John Krampus who famously traveled the countryside hitting people with a rod. Well, that's fast. Like there is no real – Krampus in the way that there was a Saint Nicholas or there was a Freddy Krueger. Like that idea gives them that added ability for people to believe in them, which I mm -hmm. think is fascinating. And it might give if they were a person ahead of time or, or before before being transformed into one of these dream creatures, it might also sort of change the nature of like they have more motive. They have more of an, mm -hmm. like they have an ego. Like yeah. if 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 you were if you are completely constructed out of dreams, then you are subject entirely to the rules of the dream realm and what people believe about you. But if you were a person before and then were pulled into this, then maybe you have like you've still got your your a little bit of that humanity, a little bit of that original person that is there, and that changes what you can do and how much power you have. Yeah, I, I really like I like that because I I like that I, that makes a lot of sense. It would explain why say Krampus. Krampus, uh, to our point about Santa Claus having yeah. kind of a, a set visual, like, ideal mm -hmm. because of capitalist hellscape, but nonetheless, because there are drawing, like, he has a, a, a reference sheet for what Santa Claus should look like. The Krampus can look a million different ways because they are subject to the interpretation of the person drawing them, whereas Santa Claus, we have accepted truths because they are commonly accepted because we have kind of things that we can trace back and... In that way that Santa Claus could kind of project like this is who I am, mm -hmm. that would that would make a lot of sense in this sort of demon filled dreamscape. So um, uh, the original Saint Nick was, was was a saint. Yes. He was the bishop of a, of a town in Turkey called Myra. What if uh, the, the Saint Nicholas effect, as it were, was the goal of canonization? 
Like Ooh. people are trying to create this effect and Santa Claus is their success. That's an interesting idea that that the church at the time knows about the ability for the belief of children to like take people and give them power after death in the dream world and that they're like mechanizing this in order to create powerful figures to fight against the demons that are also created. That's that's wild. Now, there's two things there's two things that 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 stand out to me, one of which I I want to push against and one of which like ties really sure. nicely into this. I am uncomfortable with the idea of like a large real world religion and engaging in this. Sure. That strikes me as odd, but that does flash back to our other point of reference, yeah. our other point of reference, which is Freddy Krueger. Like it is a, a specific group of people, right? Like it is the parents of whoever the characters are in Freddy Krueger who get murdered. I don't remember their names off the top of my head or yeah. the school that they take place in to that. I, to that, that notion if it is like a specific group of people who did this, like in the same way that it was like it was like six people that trapped Freddie yeah. in the boiler room. If it was like six people that were like, we're going to make this person a saint because this person has done these rituals and has established themselves in the mind of this town in these particular ways that like that will spread. Because if it's the idea that like. If it is belief in that person that mm -hmm. drives that power. Even if we divorce the church from this as like a formal thing, if yeah. it is the idea that they pushed for this so that that story would spread and more people would know of the deeds of this person and their the the belief in this person grew like that still yeah. connects back to that central idea that I think is very good. So I have I think I've we can cut the church out of this because we don't need it. Absolutely. What we do have is the conspiracy of adults who know about this power who keep the the magic alive for children. This is like a, this is the real world thing. This is what people actually do. But what it is is that there are people out there who know the truth behind Santa, just regular old folks, and they go through all of this effort to make sure that children still believe in order to empower Santa. And that's Santa's helpers. Like everybody, everybody, all the mall Santas are in on this grift, not grift. It's, it's the, it's like, it's a grift that has real power behind it. Like if you trick people into believing it, it becomes real. And so all of these all of these people who are, you know, lying to children, sort of so to speak, are actually empowering them with this belief in order to create a powerful figure. OK, so before we get too further down this thing, I want to I one of the thing I really like about this theory, the idea of Santa being a dream based entity is that it solves a couple of problems that arise immediately when you start to think about San like how Santa could do what he does. And I just want to go into a little, a couple of those uh, aspects. So first off, how does he get to every house in one night, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the obvious, I mean, this this dream concept solves a big problem there because dreams do not follow the same sort of temporal logic that the real world does. Like, mm -hmm. I'm sure everybody here has had a dream that seems to last an incredible amount of time or that would like speed up and slow down. Yeah. As time goes on and like so there's this almost infinite amount of time for things to happen in a single night within the realm of this dreamscape. That's perfect. And also the other half of that is if we're if we're leaning hard on the dream concept yeah. and then like it is it is less so that Santa Claus travels the whole world in a night and mm -hmm. more so that when you dream like Santa Claus is like appears, right? Yes. Like it is more, it is less of a, it's equally that he is empowered by dream logic, which I think is true. Mm -hmm. And also that it is simply that he appear, he is conjured or yeah. constructed by the act of dreaming. Right. And so like each individual child, children's dream that night, he gets sort of instantiated into that dream space that they create and is a presence there. That's great. Yeah. And I think that also solves like I, there's got to be a connection between the whole concept of him like coming down the chimney is also one of those those traditional like, oh, that's a sticking point. How does the guy fit down the chimney? But I my, my brain is for some reason lining that up with the dream concept of like going down a hallway and then it becoming narrower or wider depending on like how your brain is interpreting it. Like every, I, I just keep remembering all of like that, that same thing that happens on all in all my dreams, at least where I'm like going down a hallway and like suddenly it's getting cramped and cramped. And like mm -hmm. 
that that seems to line up so perfectly with the idea of space being warped inside this world as well and like yeah. allowing passage through things that shouldn't allow it or sometimes restricting it, you know, depending on how things are going. That's cool. So what what else is interesting about this? What the the thing that connects to this really nicely is this idea that dreams this this sort of dream space this liminal space of dreaming Mm -hmm. creates this very real gateway between like a dream world and our world Mm -hmm. which also gives a really nice explanation for the presence of demons and monsters and things that santa claus is then empowered to to kill or trap or enlist in his crusade to give gifts to children like that that connects very nicely to that idea if there is this space that that dreaming opens up mm-hmm. that in which the rules do not apply, then that allows for these sorts of things to exist. That allows for these other things to exist in the same sort of context. Mm-hmm. Something you mentioned that kind of resonated with me was, I love the idea of Santa prescaining demons into being his elves. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Which I believe is actually like a very true and can, if I remember, if I remember my Santa lore and I feel like I do, <laughs> That is a very true and canon thing that a lot of the elves are. For example, I Krampus, the mm-hmm. reason that he follows after Santa Claus is because he is bound with manacles, which if I remember, and this part I could be wrong and I am invoking the sacred law of do not at me. <laughs> I believe the lore is that Krampus is manacled with the manacles that Christ wore, but I don't know about that. I'm not 100%, but the idea that like, Santa Claus has tricked like Krampus follows Santa because Santa like press ganged him into being part of his mission. Like that is, I believe, a very real piece of Santa Claus lore, which is incredible. Yeah. So, man, you can imagine like especially the idea of like, well, he's he's supposed to have all these elves who make his toys. But and like but elves uh, traditionally aren't a pleasant creature necessarily like they they exist in folklore as kind of a menacing force that like Mm -hmm. could could do you harm based on rules that you do not understand and so they're kind of something that like you could imagine being a problem until somebody creates santa claus from this this dead this dead guy and he then solves this problem for people by enlisting the elves and their their huge machinations to instead provide him with the tools and weapons he needs to fight the demon creatures like and part of that is also he, he he makes toys that he gives to children but like no he's also using them to make like the magical weapons that he uses to fight the yeah. the, the boogeymen and the creatures of the night and i i adore this there's there i mean there is a going stepping back and approaching it from the meta level like yeah. there is a trope that i love more than anything that sort of comes up here which is the uh the reluctant hero villain alliance in yeah. which the hero slow or the villain slowly redeems themselves. The idea that Santa Claus could come to the elves as this menacing, you know, fey presence and be like, I've got a deal for you. Yeah. Because because Santa Claus can exist in that realm, right? We've said that this dream space, this sort of astral plane is kind of plays on rules that are not our own. And so Santa Claus can appear here and enlist them and play by their rules, right? But in doing so, can find can can deliver a new purpose onto this this menacing presence and transform and per the rules that we have laid out, mm-hmm. as people believe that the Fae and that elves and all of these other creatures are helpful and in the service of santa claus so too does that belief shape the the sort of dream space and so too does that enforce that truth onto the elves right like that it becomes this very symbiotic it is that same sort of santa claus story yeah reflected back right in the same way that santa claus was a real person who died the belief of which changed them in the dream space they gained new abilities which allowed them to spread their own belief To others, they fed that belief back and Santa Claus becomes more powerful and more magical. Mm -hmm. The same thing happens to the elves where they are a malicious presence that is enlisted to do good. They're doing good, spreads the message that they are good, and the message that they are good feeds back into the dream space and makes them good. I like that. Okay, so I have a I have a question with regards to the creation of one of these features like like Freddy Krueger or Santa Claus. Freddy in the movie is powered almost entirely by revenge. Like that he like the the children didn't even know about him at the time when he when he first starts attacking them. In that sense, it makes me think that there is 
something in addition to the belief structure and the understanding of 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 who he is and what he is that also has to sort of like trigger that ma- that uh, manifestation beyond just the belief or or is it strictly just like what people think you know like is it um, is it entirely within the minds of the people who create him or is it is there some sort of like does he i guess he must require a motive right like the 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 man who would become santa claus has to have gone to his death with like an unfinished business that he needs to have happen afterwards, much like Freddie did. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, he would never sort of his his dead soul, I guess, for lack of a better term, wouldn't like slot into the belief structure that people are creating for him because like that motive that the the um, becoming Santa fulfills something that he was unable to do during his life or as part of his death. Mm. Um, I don't. I wonder what that could be. Either he's he's like he's doing this specifically to fight the war against these these nightmare creatures, or maybe he's like it has something to do with more like pleasing the children or or providing the gifts or something like that. I'm thinking that, about that's that's where I that's where my brain went. Yeah, because it was very much. I mean, going off of the a lot of the the story, a lot of the the Saint Nicholas mm-hmm. like mythology of like. The thing that he, the thing that that he did was was give like the re one of the big reasons like around his canonization one of the big things about like his like his role in in folklore is mm. that he was about giving like about giving gifts to children and like celebrating children and like helping bring light to to dark and cold places yeah so if it is if it is like a part of that 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 feels right to me mm-hmm. but it also raises an interesting thought mm-hmm. which is if what if what if the demons aren't there until santa claus becomes santa claus mm. like what if it's 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 the sant we said that santa claus uses this sort of dream space that we've created to to move between worlds and to come into our world yeah if that puncture is what allows something like the Krampus to move through, then, well, then Santa Claus feels probably feels like he has an obligation to stop that because what have I wrought with my own hands? I like that idea. Although I think could I put, I'm going to put a little twist on it. Go for it. Twist it. Which is that at the time of his creation, that door had been closed, but that this cycle has existed in the past for other figures. So, like, let's say. Uh, one of the figures that sort of leads into our current our current version of Santa is Odin. Like, what if this whole cycle happened before with a man who then would become known as Odin? There were there were the nightmare creatures. He he turned into a figure after his death. He brought with him when he when he he made the wall between our world and the dream world thinner, and he brought with it all of the trolls and dragons and monsters and giants of his mythology with him, and that that arc followed its whole thing where he was then tasked with defeating these creatures that he had created and then at the end of his arc the, he realizes that the the only way to truly stop the demons and the, and the giants was to close the door forever and stop being the god odin he had to close it off and like with it close the door to all of these other threats with it and then things were quiet for a while and then santa comes about and he does the same thing. He opens the door again because he has a, he has a task he wants to complete and brings with it all of these old demons in new forms because the belief that shapes them is different now, several hundred years later. And that means that there is a, there's a, there's a solution to, or not a solution, but there's an ending to Santa's story, which is that he Mm -hmm. is, he can fight the demons for as, as long as we believe in him, but it's the only way to truly put a stop to them is to like end the legend and, have him finally go on and stop because it is it's the belief in him that brings the two the dream world and the and the real world together and so he, yeah he creates them when he when he when he instantiates and he brings them with him so like he is both the cause of and solution to that problem mm-hmm. okay are there any other figures that jump out at you as another one of these dream constructs i mean there, there's the other holiday creatures like the easter bunny I feel like um, the tooth fairy kind of falls in that milieu. Yes. For sure, the tooth fairy I think feels feels right. And there's I'm gonna just to steal from Terry Pratchett outright. There's the whole idea that the tooth fairy takes things like teeth because 
if teeth were gotten are, are magical, um, like bits of, of someone's body is used to do harm to them with magic. And so the tooth fairy takes them and keeps them safe specifically to keep like monsters from getting hold of children's teeth and using that to cast spells or control them. Freaking metal idea. The thing that I love about that idea really specifically and the tooth fairy, mm-hmm. uh, I love that it connects to holiday mascots mm-hmm. in a less like there, there's a very specific space that like that really resonates with me that like connects with me that I really dig. Yeah. And that is I don't know the best way to put this aside from like secular holiday mascots like yeah you're saying like santa claus or the tooth fairy or mm-hmm. the east these things that like a lot of them you know are created to holiday figures that really don't have anything to do with the holiday itself but that have been created largely for commercialist reasons yeah. but like these figures that exist in the minds of children as an association with the holiday yeah I think are fat like it's fascinating to think of them as these 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 constructs and the idea that like that sort of that space is a, a creation of this dream concept that is because mm-hmm. that like that that feels more driven by belief to me and that feels very interesting. Yeah, and it, I think it also I mean that to keep up with the holiday theme, I think that brings in Halloween really easily because that's a night when people expect the the demons to show up without some sort of defender and that's a night when people are left to their own devices to figure out how to how to battle that problem and the solution seems to have been busted <laughs> i was thinking Is that where you were gonna go and i was thinking it's a it's one big trick it's one big yeah. trick or treat everybody disguises themselves as one of these monsters one of the things that are supposed to be feared or as a now except that was the traditional version old days it would be you i'm gonna be a ghost or a goblin i'm gonna be a scary thing and now people are either ghost goblins, werewolves, vampires, or they choose to be a great hero of some sort. They choose a Marvel character. They choose Elsa who has, you know, magical princess powers. Like it's one way as a way to appear as something you're not in order to scare off all of these sort of rogue demons that might be flying around that night. And if we take the idea that belief is inherent, that like belief or common wisdom is inherently magic Mm -hmm. and apply it to something like that, there is a fundamental truth to Halloween that like in the minds of children creates a very powerful presence in this sort of dream space. Yes. And that is, uh, that is this idea that we all know it's a mask. Yeah. Right. It's that idea that like, Oh my God, there's a goblin. Like that's terrifying, but I know that that's really Reggie like Mm -hmm. it. And that truth feels like it is itself a powerful thing to ward off the ward off these sort of dream demons is ironically the idea that none of this is real right if the act is us putting on costumes and going door to door and going ah i'm a witch then it's looking out and saying none of those are real monsters these are all ordinary people dressing in costumes if that is the commonly accepted truth Mm -hmm. then that would mean that that truth feeds into the dream space and there are no monsters ironically that means that halloween might be the safest day of all (laughs) Yeah, that's an excellent version of that. I like that a lot. Yeah. Let's see what other holiday or what other holiday mascots can we think of? Um, is there a way to get the groundhog from Groundhog Day in on this? Pucks I pu- mean, yeah, there is actually. Now that I think about yeah. it, I have one. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, please. Real, uh, what you had you had said a lot earlier that in the dream space, time doesn't mm-hmm. work in the same way. If one of these dream figures emerges and doesn't see his shadow. Mm-hmm. Well, then some of that dream space might just leech out and suddenly there is suddenly winter is six weeks longer, despite the fact that we have a really definitive day that scientifically yeah. is the end of winter. Oh, that's great. Punxsutawney Phil is actually like he's not saying whether or not when I mean, he is, act, you know, in a way saying whether or not winter is going to end. But he's what he's really saying is, did some of the dream time leak into the real world over yeah. the over the dark part of the year? And that it is tied to. Does Phil see his shadow? Yeah. Well, he's always going to see his shadow unless the rules of reality aren't playing as normal. Right. And that, I mean, frankly, if we're talking Groundhog Day, that complete, we're, we're pulling in Groundhog Day, the movie in canon here, because if a particular individual, say, needed redemption, a creature with a, a, a particular dream logic time ability could totally trap a man over and over in the same day. Yeah. Um, 
that's perfect. I want that. I want that so much. Finally, we understand the central logic of the film Groundhog Day, yes. which I believe is what we were doing. Here. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> I believe that was the goal. Oh, I love the idea that the, the groundhog is sort of the induction agent for the, these new members of this pantheon. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Oh, man. I guess that does that mean that uh, Phil Connors is on his way to becoming one of these figures? If he's if if he's been targeted by by Punxsutawney Phil for recruitment, I love that. Here, see now now there's a there's a level of metaphor that we're talking about here that I kind of have to put the pinhole in and say outright yeah. and make overt because I think it connects very nicely here. What we're talking about is something becoming an accepted piece of like pop culture mythology. Yeah. So the idea that. Um, and I'm thinking about this because I watched the movie Palm Springs recently, which if you have not seen, it was absolutely fantastic. I adored it. It was a fantastic movie. Yeah. Oh, so good. But in that movie, they say, uh, and I think they don't literally say it, but they say this is one of those infinite time loop scenarios that you've probably read about. And it is very specifically, I guess I should have spoiler warning that for the movie Palm Springs, but it comes up in the first like 10 minutes. Sure. So it's not like that big a spoiler. But um, but it, it plays on the idea that the people in it understand the rules of Groundhog Day. Mm -hmm. And so that idea of um, Bill Murray's character in Groundhog Day becoming this dream figure yeah. is because we all know the rules. We've all seen and know the rules of the movie Groundhog Day. So if someone were to become trapped in a time loop. Yeah. Well, then I know the rules. I understand. I believe that this is that this is how this is going to play out. It yeah. feeds into that idea, gives this dream space power and creates a, a Groundhog Day situation that follows the rules of the movie Groundhog Day. Thus, to your point, creating him as a dream figure. Yeah. In the sense that the movie becomes part of the perpetuation of the myth, the creation of the, the figure is also all of these media that surround them as well. Which allows us to pull in any freaking movie we want, I guess, at that point, <laughs> or or TV show or comic or whatever. Which means that you are in the modern era of this idea. You could just be as you could be as likely to be saved by Captain America in your dreams as you would be by Santa Claus or another another uh, of these figures. Like we, as a culture, creating these heroes that our children are allowed to have. Like we are actually creating the, the defense line for the children against their own nightmares, you know, that yeah. can, that can, that can actually harm them. I love that. Storytelling is magic. Yes. Getting a very almost wholesome American gods vibe from this. Yeah. That I was I drawn, I've been drawing on a lot of American gods yeah. uh, energy here, but I like the idea that it connects to like pop culture in a way that like pop culture specifically can be magic yeah. and like that is something that is like personally very important to me and so i feel i feel that very strongly he said while wearing a superman t-shirt <laughs> i'm not actually wearing a superman t-shirt i said that looked down realized it and then realized that i was on camera so i can't even lie about it well so i have to call myself out on mic and say i'm not actually wearing a superman that just means that you're wearing a superman t-shirt in your heart at all times in my heart at all times <laughs> yeah. literally at all moments of the day yeah <laughs> Uh, okay, so are there any other figures we we want to pull into this this grand mythos, or any other aspects of Santa that we haven't pulled already? How does this interact? I guess maybe how does this interact with adults? Because one thing that always bugs me about the the Santa movies, Polar Express or the Santa Claus or anything like that, where it's where is the question, what do the adults think is happening? Like if if uh, presents just show up underneath the tree every night or not every every Christmas, who do they think got those there? To like they know they didn't. You know, they, the parents know they didn't put them there, but they also simultaneously don't believe in Santa. How does that work? Is there an aspect for us to um, to attack it from that? I've also put when I was thinking about this theory and playing with this theory, okay. I did think about that because I thought about that as well. And I think this is where I get uh, a little emotional and I, I, I pull back and I pull back the curtain just a smidge. OK. Because I think that, Zach, I think you just really said it. I think the truth is that at a certain point, like, we believe that this stops being real, so it stops being real. Okay. Like, that, it is that very Polar Express idea of, like, once you stop believing, like, once, once the commonly accepted truth is that this stops being real, it stops being real. But 
the thing is, but there's two parts to that. Mm-hmm. And one is, wait, there might just be one part to it. I think I lost the second part. But the thing is, to your point, Zach, that's when we start making it real for, for kids, right? Like peeling back the curtain just a little bit. And this is a spoiler. This is a spoiler for Santa Claus. As as adults, we all understand that Santa Claus is not real. However, for children, like for children that believe in Santa Claus, we go out and we buy presents. We put them under the tree. We tell these kids stories about Santa Claus. We show them cartoons about Santa Claus. We sing them songs about Santa Claus. And we make this very strange monster hunting toy giving figure real for kids. Right. For people who we want to instill the values of kindness and generosity and all of these things that are associated with the character of Santa Claus. So in doing so, we create and in doing so in a world in which, in which belief drives a magical thing, we create a magical creature called Santa Claus. Kids believe in Santa. Santa is real. And at a certain point, Kids start saying, well, I actually heard Santa Claus is just my parents putting presents under a tree. That belief is cut. You become an adult who has understood that Santa Claus is real. But that means my parents probably put presents under my tree. So I'm going to go do that for kids. And it creates this cycle of Santa Claus as a dream figure with this infinite power, but who naturally fades and t- and is taken the place of by yeah. people doing the Santa Claus thing and creating this myth for children. And in the 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 history that we've created for our version of Santa, where this was a real man who wanted mm-hmm. children to have gifts, and therefore uh, when the belief after his death drew him into the dream world where he became a, a, a magical figure, he started to, to do that in the dream world. But – because the dream world and the real world only intersect when the child when a child is asleep or when somebody who believes is asleep then when he when the dream ends and he leaves those gifts that he gave would have dissolved away they're gone mm-hmm. because they were only part of that one world they come from a, a, a place that can't persist but by his efforts to like by his becoming this figure and making this an important part of, of, of society and something that, that even the adults think is, is important to, to um, keep up, he made by, – by basically by recruiting these adults to keep the children believing, he gets them to do the thing that he wanted to happen, which was provide children with gifts and like give hope to these young, you know, these young people. So he – he can't do what he really wants, which is to give children gifts. He can't do that directly, but by being Santa and creating the belief system around Santa, he causes that to happen anyway. Even if you don't really believe him, as long as the cultural norm of giving the gift to children, he still gets his goal, which is to give these gifts and make sure that children have something happy in the dark part of the year. And in the meantime, he also fights the demons and the nightmares for us. Yeah, I love that. That is fantastic. Well, I think we've pretty well covered it. You've you've provided us. I think we I think we got there. Yeah, I think you've provided us with a great um, <laughs> a great version of Santa. Which is yeah, I I will call this. You have definitely delivered on the grand unified Santa theory. Look, a gauntlet was put in front of me when you gave me a list of options, and one of them was Santa Claus, and I said, "Well, I'm not going to not take Santa Claus." <laughs> okay. Well, I think we're going to le- leave it there. Jeff, is there anything you'd like to to plug before we let you go? Oh, there sure is. Um, I am the host of Talking Nog, which is a yearly tradition podcast honoring a yearly tradition. Uh, We talk about the past, present, and future of everybody's favorite eggy, creamy, boozy, yuletide treat. Uh, I I stream that every year on Twitch, uh, the live recording of that podcast. uh, That'll air on December 23rd. I'm not sure the exact time, but if you follow me on Twitter at Party of One Pod, you'll get that. Uh, also, I guess I do other things. Um, I, you can find my podcasts and games at jeffstormer.com, and that includes Party of One, which is an actual play focused on two-player role-playing games, and all my fantasy children, which if you enjoyed the sort of collaborative world-building that we did on this episode, my best friend Aaron and I take a listener-submitted prompt, and every week we spin that into an original character populating a shared uh, fantasy world one story at a time. I, yeah, I will, I will back that up. If you like Monster Mechanics, you will like... All my fantasy children. It is the closest relative that we have in the podcasting world, as far as I can tell. All right. Well, bye. Until next time. Ho, 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 ho.
Okay, I am freezing my butt off because the only quiet place that I can record right now is outside in my backyard because I left my 3D printer running when I was supposed to record this outro. So let's do this real quick. Uh, thank you for joining us for this episode of Monster Mechanics. And I'd like to thank Jeff for joining us as a special guest. That was a wild episode. A little bit of housekeeping. We would normally be putting out a bonus episode next week. Uh, but we're going to take that week off, our first week off in over a year. I don't know when we return the week after if it's going to be a bonus or a full episode because uh, Zach and I haven't figured that out yet. Other than that, the only call to action I can give you is to have a good couple of weeks and uh, to take it easy. Now for the credits. Monster Mechanics is produced and edited by me, Scott Paladin, and hosted by myself and my best friend, Zach Jakeways, with special guest this week, Jeff Stormer from the Party of One podcast and All My Fantasy Children and Talking Nog. All of the ideas generated during this podcast are released under a do-what-the-f-you-want public license.